My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIA webinar on Pandemonium, Europe's COVID response. And this is my first webinar as the incoming director of research at the IIA. I'm thrilled to be taking up this role, and I'm looking forward to interacting with many of you over the months and years ahead. We're delighted to be joined today by Luke van Midler, a professor at Leiden University, who will speak to us today on the subject COVID-19 pandemic and what it means for Europe. Professor Van Midlar, or Luke, as he's told us to call him, will speak to us for about 20 minutes, maybe a little more, and then we'll go to questions and answers with the audience. Uh, I'll introduce Luke and his topic in a moment. You'll be able to join the discussion during the meeting using the Q&A function on Zoom, and I encourage you all to do so. Please feel free to send questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to as many of them as possible. When asking a question, please remember to state your name and your affiliation if you have one, and if you feel that it's relevant. A reminder today as well that today's presentation and questions and answers are both on the record. Please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce Luke, Professor Van Midlar, and hand over to him then. So Luke Van Midlar is the Professor of Foundations and Practice of the European Union and its institutions at Leiden University and one of the world's foremost experts on European politics. He's a member of the Dutch Advisory Council on International Affairs and chair of its Commission on European Integration, as well as an unpaid special advisor to European Commission Vice President Franz Timmermans. He writes a column, and indeed he writes prolifically, and a column on European and international affairs with the Dutch newspaper NRC, Handelsblad, and is the author of several books, including uh, Politicide, 1999, the Passage to Europe in, 20, in 2009, Alarms and Excursions, Improvising Politics in the European Stage in 2019, and indeed his latest work, which you'll see over Luke's right shoulder, Pandemonium, Saving Europe, with Agenda Publishing 2021, which Luke will refer to today. Professor Van Midlar, Luke, thank you again very much for being with us, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Barry, for this kind introduction and to the IIEA for this uh, really nice invitation to speak, even if it's uh, over Zoom, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. I, I was uh, in your offices, I think three years ago for another uh, event, which was also book related at the time, but I know very well that uh, around your institute, it is a really vibrant community of, of people interested in and engaged and experienced in, in European and international affairs. So very pleased to be able to, to address uh, this, this audience. Now, indeed, the, the, the new book, Pandemonium, uh, Saving Europe, is a kind of sequel, uh, to some extent, to, uh, to the book uh, I discussed with some of you uh, three years ago, Alarms and Excursions. That one was on, on Europe's decade of crisis from the Eurozone to migration and, and, and Brexit and Trump. And, and Russia as well, I, I'm afraid, already back then. And this book, in a way, takes up uh, the story of Europe's response uh, to COVID. So it's only one crisis. It's a shorter book, therefore. It's, uh, uh, and it also offers a kind of a synthesis of, of some of my uh, previous ideas, including from, from the passage to Europe. Maybe I do take the opportunity here to thank my translator, Liz Waters. I've originally written the book in, in Dutch, uh, but like my previous work, uh, it has been beautifully translated uh, by, by her. We work hand in hand. Uh, normally, I, I don't always uh, mention this, but I know in Ireland, you are, if I may say so, a, a nation of, of keen readers of, uh, of books. So, uh, and I know you, you attach importance to, to style and, 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 and pace, uh, which is something dear to my heart as well, let's say as an author, which is what I feel at heart. Now, what I wanna do in indeed in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, as, as Barry suggested, is to um, address three points. First, give you a kind of overall take of, 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 of the book's uh, claims and what it does. And then I want to take up as points two and three, two um, more focused points. One related to public opinion, 
and the role public opinion played in this specific crisis. And as a final point, the geopolitical dimension of this crisis, and that will also allow me to, to say a few words on the situation of, of Ireland to, to the extent I, I dare venturing uh, there. But, 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 but I think um, it, it would be nice to, to close there and to open also the discussion uh, with all of you to which I'm, I'm very much looking, looking forward. Now, first, therefore, on what does the book bring and why, indeed, a, a book on, on this crisis. In a way, my fascination, fascination with these moments of, of, of turmoil is, is not by, by some kind of, uh, of uh, pessimism or voyeurism or, or whatever, but it is my conviction that as a political analyst, you can really learn a lot on a political body during moments of crisis. These are moments of truth after all. Just like in, in, in private life, you may sometimes get to know your, your friends better uh, at a moment uh, of trouble. The same is true in a way in, in public life. And you also get to know uh, forces, weaknesses and, and strengths of, of political bodies during crisis. Now, in a way, the starting point for me for, for writing Pandemonium was the very sharp, incredible contrast between the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, February, let's say 2020, very bleak moment for all our nations, but also for the European Union as a whole. The contrast between that moment, bitter moment, and the relatively robust response pretty soon as of the summer of, of 2020. Now, I'm, I have no doubt you all have very, very uh, sharp memories of, 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 of these early stages of the crisis locally. Uh, I've also, in a way, experienced it here from Brussels, where I'm sticking very locally. I mean, there's a window there on one end of the street, uh, there's a hospital on the other end of the street. Uh, there's a church where a lot of uh, bells were tolling in those days and a lot of uh, ambulances coming by as well. So, so, th so it was a very local experience, but very soon I was also drawn into this common uh, European experience. And to just briefly remind you of that bleak moment of February 2020, these, these, these were the moment when we got uh, footage from or, or, or rumors from hellish scenes in hospitals in, in northern Italy and Lombardy. Uh, where, uh, according to rumors, people were dying in the corridors. A moment when Italy asked for help to its European neighbors, uh, to Brussels, and where no help came. Uh, comparable stories from, from Spain and other member states. Borders uh, were closing, which for some people in the EU is, is, is very traumatic. And, and pretty soon, and almost without surprise, there were stories of imminent uh, economic uh, disaster, mass layoffs, maybe the euro would come under, uh, under pressure, etc. So as of uh, late March 2020, people already started predicting the end of the EU or, or of the Eurozone. Huh? As in previous crises, most notably the Eurozone crisis, to some extent migration crisis as well, there was a, again a, a chorus of prophets of doom predicting the end of, of the EU. So very bleak moment, bitter reproaches among member states as well, because uh, there was this lack of, of, of solidarity, uh, public opinion very disappointed. And therefore, it is rather remarkable, in my view, how quickly the situation uh, turned around. You could see and feel things moving from, from Easter uh, 2020, April, uh, May, and by summer 2020, two very big, almost revolutionary decisions of a joint response had been taken by EU leaders in close cooperation with the Commission. The first one was related to public health, and it was a decision to jointly procure 
the vaccine. This was June 2020. This was very unexpected because at the start of the crisis, the story uh, in and around Brussels uh, was that the EU had no competence in the field of public health. So this was a very horrible uh, suffering and a, and a human tragedy for many, many people. But unfortunately, this was more or less the official line of defense. The EU could not act in the field of, of public health. And here we were four or five months later, the EU itself, the commission of President von der Leyen was going to procure the vaccine for 450 million uh, EU citizens. In a way, it was going to provide the, the light at the end of the tunnel. So that, that was a remarkable turnaround. The second formidable decision uh, obviously was, was taken in the summer of, uh, in July, 2020, the decision in principle at the time to establish a Corona recovery fund. Well, it took uh, some 36 months to work that out, that all out in legislative detail. And, but meanwhile, as we are now uh, a year and a half after, these funds have been started to, to be disbursed uh, to member states. And it was in that decision that Germany in particular, the Federal Republic, crossed two big red lines in the German uh, monetary debate because Chancellor Merkel accepted to uh, the idea that the commission would raise money on the markets. So a kind of euro bonds, which were completely taboo during the Eurozone crisis and about which she, Merkel had said that something like that would not happen in her lifetime. Probably she meant in her political lifetime, but nevertheless, it was, uh, uh, crossing uh, a red line. And also second red line, these, the money, as you know, will be distributed almost without conditions. So it was, these were grants and not loans. And that really sounded a little bit like the transfer union the Germans never wanted. So that was my starting point, very bleak outset and remarkable response, re resilience, Dynamism, how can, we, how can we explain that? How can we explain such a thing? Now, there's, there's two types of, of, uh, of answer I, I will offer here. And one, and that's still, let's say, part of the general take of the book is to say, well, this crisis is, is one in a series. It's not the first uh, very difficult period the European Union is, is going through. And the EU collectively learned from previous crises. I think, um, well, I don't want to get too, too detailed here, but, but, but for those of you who are familiar with, with, the, with the Eurozone and, and economic and financial operations, uh, they will remember that, that the response to this crisis could also draw on the institutions that have been built a decade ago. Uh, when I worked for European Council President Herman van Rompuy in the years 2010-2014, uh, these were the, the uh, all too hectic and dramatic years of the Eurozone crisis. I remember in the early days, van Rompuy, a former Belgian budget minister and prime minister, was often complaining that in Europe, for the Euro, there was an empty toolkit. Huh? He, as a politician, he wanted some, some tools, whatever, a hammer or and there was nothing in the toolkit. And 10 years on, there was and is um, a European stability mechanism, uh, which has been used, even if there was some political um, uh, drawbacks to that as well, the European Central Bank, which needed two years almost in the Euro crisis before it finally acted decisively, uh, just took a few weeks here to, to step in uh, and to tame uh, this crisis, and so there are other examples. So, in a way, in, in this crisis, that, that is one of my theses, uh, the European Union continues its overall transformation or, or metamorphosis from a set of institutions uh, originally built to, to construct a market, to build a market, 
and to do what I call rules politics to a political body able to deal with crisis situations, with certain events, and to engage in what I call events politics. So the EU goes from rules politics to still doing that, huh? because the market remains very important, we'll come back to that, but also uh, doing uh, and able to do events politics. Now I could very quickly break that down in, in a few differences uh, to, for those of you who are uh, perhaps less familiar with, with this overall view. I mean, one key difference obviously is, is the element of, of time and of speed. When you're talking about making rules for the internal market, it's a matter of negotiations, uh, slow, careful, um, patient negotiations between member states, institutions, stakeholders, etc., where it can take years between uh, the start of a legislative proposal and, and the day it will finally end in the uh, union's official journal up to seven years. When we talk about crisis politics, it can be in some instances, it was just a matter of two or three days for the EU to come up with a response. Going back to the Euro crisis again, I remember weekend in May 2010 when the EU had 72 hours to find 750 billion euros somehow in a series of frantic phone calls, an emergency summit on a Friday evening, uh, a legislative proposal done by the Commission on the Sunday for the first time in, in, in history of the Commission uh, before the markets were opening on, in Asia on, on Monday morning. There were moments like that during the migration crisis as well. So completely different time dimension, different experience and perception of the public as well. Huh? Whereas internal market is, 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 uh, can be pretty boring stuff, very important obviously, a lot of financial stakes uh, for those who are uh, in it, uh, be it companies or, or, or NGOs, etc. but rather far away for, for citizens. Um, whereas in, in the uh, crisis, big crises there, um, that was about sometimes about a lot of money, right? taxpayers' money, about uh, austerity measures, um, sovereignty and identity, think about migration, uh, membership of the EU, Brexit. So front page news day after day. And, and, and I know in Ireland as well, Brexit, of course, resonates uh, particularly perhaps more as it's all that was farther away than, than the migration crisis and, and so has, has, has the Eurozone crisis over a, year, a decade ago. Now, and as a result of both the dimension of speed and, and public expectations, I think you can also see a change of ca a cast. A, a, um, that is to say that alongside the traditional Brussels casting of, of commissioners and, and uh, ministers in, in their various councils and MEPs. In crisis politics, you also see heads of state of government entering the stage. German Chancellor, French President, Irish Taoiseach, Dutch Prime Minister, etc. They collectively take a lot of these important uh, decisions. And some of that interaction you also saw uh, during the pandemic, interaction between European Council leaders and, and Commission von der Leyen in particular. So that is um, one answer, coming back to that, uh, why uh, the union was able to react relatively uh, quickly uh, to the pandemic because of um, learning experiences in between and because the union is no longer the same as it was back in 2005 or 2007 at the very outset of the first uh, economic and, and, and financial crisis. Now there's a second factor and th this brings me to the also to the second point of, of, of what I um, what I promised to you uh, that is the role of public opinion. I'll try to be relatively brief about that so we have a bit more time for the for the geopolitical dimension but but I do think and I uh, Barry if you want I can expand more uh, during the QA but I, I do think there was a really unique feature of, of the pandemic and of, of, of the COVID crisis. And that is that it was a public call for action, which stirred 
the political response. So it was almost a bottom-up thing. There was this public outcry from Italy, Spain, France, and elsewhere beginning that Europe somehow had to act. Even if, I guess, in minds of people, it was not necessarily, necessarily clear who would that be institutionally and all that, but this crisis was so overwhelming. Right? It was clearly also nobody's fault. It took place against the backdrop of, of, of big global forces early on already. You could see China and positioning, uh, et cetera, that people wanted Europe to act. And um, there were, so there was this, this call for action and it was also heeded in particular by Chancellor Merkel who heard uh, that call and who decided, and I think that this, this is really decisive, uh, that because of the, the nature, the, the unique nature of this crisis of public health, the human suffering, the dimension of life and death even, uh, Germany in particular could not afford to again play the rule of the Scrooge of the plot uh, or the, uh, the, 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 the master of discipline and austerity and that Germany had to step in. And that was one of the key moments in this whole crisis. And as a result, I think the, the power configuration in the European Union in particular in economic and financial affairs has dramatically changed. And I think maybe just going one last time briefly back to the financial crises and the Eurozone crisis there, it was clearly, it was top-down measures. Huh? the decisions that were taken, be it on reforms or austerity or solidarity, they were asked for by economic experts, by central bankers, and government leaders took these decisions against their will and they had to also almost push them through very reluctant parliaments and public opinions. So that, uh, that is new huh? and that, I think really accelerated the political action, this public opinion dimension. Now let me spend, to, to conclude a, a little time on, on the geopolitical uh, dimension, because that is, uh, in my view, the other really fascinating uh, novelty of, 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 of this crisis, um, where Europeans, during the Europeans as a whole, and eh, not just uh, Europe, as in EU-related, but people on the European continent, uh, let's put it very broadly, experienced a new and completely unexpected vulnerability in terms of public health, uh, because a crisis like this, an infectious disease, it was simply not supposed to happen on the European continent. This was, let's say, for faraway Asia, for Africa, uh, think of SARS or Ebola, that was not supposed to happen in our uh, uh, welfare, uh, modern states, etc. So it was a moment of vulnerability, but not only in terms of public health, also geopolitically. Huh? It was a moment, what I call in the book, of geopolitical loneliness, of solitude. The Europeans felt alone. On the one hand, we saw early on China coming in with its by now famous mask and vaccine diplomacy. When Italy asked help to its European um, partners, late February, 2020, I mentioned this, none help came. It was the Chinese Red Cross, which landed a plane full of medical material on an airport around Rome, and not in Milan, which was the center of the crisis, understressing even the diplomatic uh, importance of, of, uh, of this action. So mass diplomacy people. So China in a way has entered the uh, public awareness as a, ge as a geopolitical actor of the Europeans. So obviously in crowds like the ones we are now here uh, among foreign and, and the European policy expert, China had been there. But for the public at large, I would say China is now an actor. But it was not only that, it was also looking at the other side of the globe, the United States, which was less engaged or 
to put it less diplomatically, which was nowhere to be seen, or which was, as uh, your own Fintan O'Toole put it in a memorable col column, which was an object of pity for the first time probably in the, in the history of the US. Uh, the US was an object of pity in particular uh, at the moment when President Trump recommended his citizens to, uh, to, to, to take some bleach uh, to cure or to be better protected against the virus and dozens of Americans ended in hospital after uh, they had searched under their own sinks for, for some, uh, some ad hoc medication. Now, as a result of that moment of, 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 of geopolitical loneliness, in a way, EU leaders took the third big decision. After the vaccines and the Corona Recovery Fund, it was less concrete, maybe than those two, but still conceptually very important. They endorsed the concept of strategic autonomy. And this is October 2020, European Council, for the first time. Uh, this concept of strategic autonomy or strategic sovereignty, as it is now called in the German coalition government agreement, uh, was endorsed. Until then, it had always encountered a lot of resistance, um, in particular by defense ministers, because it was considered to be anti-American implicitly or anti-NATO. But now, as a result of of uh, the pandemic, in a way, this, this concept has been taken from the pure security defense field into economic policy, economic security, industrial policy uh, more widely. Of course, the pharmaceutical vulnerability, the lack of uh, uh, mouth masks in, in, in Europe was the immediate uh, cause of this uh, change, but it's going much farther than that. And indeed, it will have ramifications for, for EU economic uh, policy uh, much more widely, and it may even challenge the EU's traditional open stance on world trade, an open stance which I know is, is cherished by Ireland, and also, if I may say so, by my own country, uh, the Netherlands, even if I'm speaking to you from, from Brussels, obviously I follow closely what's happening in and around The Hague. Now, briefly, it's good to remind ourselves that this strategic autonomy this, um, decision or this concept was not the only one being put forward at the same time. Because the two other great economic powers in the world, China and the US, took more or less simultaneously the same conclusion. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping developed from May 2020 as well the concept of dual circulation, which is more or less the same thing, making a difference between um, uh, the, the domestic market for China and the market um, with the rest of the world, where there's more state help in a way, state support for enterprises. But also, uh, then candidate Joe Biden in July 2020 made exactly the same analysis as part of his, his election campaign, that the, the United States needed to be more resilient in terms of supply change, and he promised to take action, and he has done since. So, and of course, this is not just a pandemic, this is taking place against the, uh, the global uh, backdrop of the US-China rivalry, uh, where uh, not just pharmaceutical material, but a lot of industrial production is, is, is part of, of a global fight on sup supremacy, uh, be it uh, semiconductors or uh, rare earth or uh, 5G, etc. And so when we look at the, at the EU more particularly, it's therefore important to realize that this is, this is a wider global movement almost of economic and industrial reorientation, which will get all kinds of, of co policy consequences uh, in, the, in the Brussels uh, system, but these forces, they will remain with us. The pandemic has accelerated them, maybe brought them to light to some extent, um, but they will remain with us. And therefore, 
it is not uh, it, it's not just ab about the European Union post Brexit. Hmm? Um, I don't have to explain that here, but it is almost about the European Union after the end of Pax Americana, or at least after a global multilateral etc. order, which has been with us since 1945. So the rupture or the uh, is is much more fundamental. Now I see it's it's 2:30, Barry, so we'll stop here. But what I will offer uh, in answer to some of your questions, I hope is a comparison between Ireland and the Netherlands in this respect, which, which may be instructive uh, for you in how to relate to these changes. But, but at this point, I, I, I don't want to speak too long. So please over to you and, and to the venerable audience.